Hi, my name is Terry Doherty, and I am the designer of the Glory and Empire series by Lock and Load Publishing. In this how-to video, I'll discuss the basics of terrain, stacking, facing, and formation. So in Glory and Empire, every uh, hex on the map fits into a certain category of terrain. There are four categories, including uh, open terrain, light density terrain, medium density terrain, and high density terrain. <coughs> There's also hex side terrain features, things like rivers and streams, hedges, walls, anything that might uh, impede movement across the hex side. <clears throat> There's also contours, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, as far as uh, hex side features, there's another category of hex side features that are particular uh, obstacles for movement across those, and we call those hex side obstacles. And those have impacts on uh, whether or not uh, units take a disorder check when they cross those, and is important for where units decide to defend. Talking a little bit about uh, formations and terrain, we have the allowed formations and terrain chart, at, which you can see here. So uh, in open terrain, any formation can be can be formed, and same with light density terrain. In medium density terrain, then uh, units typically have to form uh, column, road column, or uh, full skirmish mode. And in uh, high density terrain, Cavalry can only enter the hexes on a, on a road and in a road column. And same thing for artillery. And there's another classification called fortified posts, which can be either medium or high density. Those are typically uh, churches or granaries that are, have been fortified or possibly field works. So some hexide terrain is uh, classified as a hexide obstacle. So here we have a minor, or a, yeah, minor stream, and <clears throat> when units cross it, they're required to take a disorder check. Or if they assault or charge units that are on the other side of the hexide obstacle, then they enter disorder before they go in for the attack. <clears throat> so we can see that on the terrain effects chart where it's listed as a hexide obstacle in this column for the terrain type. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about contours. So contours are kind of a special category, and <clears throat> we kind of we put the maps together with GIS data. So these are the actual contours for the terrain that are in place, <clears throat> and they don't always line up with the, the hex side. So we've got some rules for handling that, and it's pretty straightforward. So generally, if there's more than one contour in a hex, then you're going to pay increased movement costs for going across those, you know, for, for moving from one hex to another. So to determine the MP cost for crossing it from one hex to another for contours, we count the number of contours between the center dots and the hex. So if we moved from, say, this hex to this hex, there's one contour between the center of this hex to the center of that hex. So we'd pay the cost for going up one contour. For infantry, that'd be plus one. For cavalry, it's plus two. Over here, we have a case where we're going from, say, from this hex to this hex, that's one contour, so that'd be the one contour cost. But if we go from this hex to this hex, that's two contours. So we're gonna pay the cost for going up two contours, which is quite significant. So the, the contour interval on this map is 20 meters per, per uh, contour interval. So going up two is uh, 40 meters across 125 meter hex, which is, which is fairly steep. <clears throat> and there are some cases on the map down here where the, the high ridge of Columbiera uh, where we have three contours between center dots, and that's quite expensive. That units have to expend all their movement to go up those. Um, we also include uh, hex sides that have uh, more than uh, one contour uh, are also considered hex side obstacles. So back up to this case, if we have this case, then this hex side here would be a, a, uh, a hex side obstacle. And we determine that by saying the, uh, the contour at the highest level by that hex is the hexide obstacle. So the hexide along here would be the hexide obstacle. Okay, so let's cover a little bit on stacking. So stacking is fairly simple. We have a simple stacking chart, which varies by the density of the terrain. <clears throat> so open terrain is 20 strength points. Light density is 15, medium density is 12, and high density is 8. And then there's a special case for road column where you can only have one counter per hex. 
And then in the advanced rules, there's a, another restriction for uh, units in open column. So the stacking is on the counters for cavalry, infantry, and artillery is in the lower left. And we just add them all up in the hex and come up with a stacking point. So units are not allowed to voluntarily violate stacking limits. And so during retreat, if units retreat through a hex and violate stacking uh, limits, then uh, the units take a morale check. So the morale um, is in the lower right corner of the, the unit. And if the, <clears throat> the morale check, if you roll two dice, they're 10 sided die. And if you uh, are less than or equal to the number, then it's a fail. If it's greater than the number, then it's a pass. Okay, so now let's cover a little bit about uh, facings and formations. So for uh, <clears throat> column, we face a hex side. For line, you face a hex point. And artillery can face a, a hex side or a hex point. You know, it's, their, it's the player's choice. And they can face a different direction than the infantry that's stacked with it. So they could face a hex side like that, or they could face a hex point or in any direction. They don't have to stay facing the same way as the, uh, as the infantry. So uh, for units in column, they have three front hexes, two flank hexes, and a rear hex. For units in line, it's two, two front, flank, two flank, and rear and rear hex. Now a little bit on uh, skirmishing. <laughs> so skirmishers, we have two types of skirmishers in the system. One is uh, the skirmishers on Tirailleur, which is where the uh, skirmishers act in parent with the concert battalion. <clears throat> so if you take a look at the counter here, you can see the number six with the strength points. Three is the, uh, the number of skirmishers that they can deploy, number of skirmisher strength points. So this one is uh, a grenadier battalion, so it can deploy up to half its guys as skirmishers. This here is a, a green, greener light battalion, and it can deploy only one of its, of its uh, strength points as skirmishers. So we denote that by putting an SK1, 2, or 3 marker on the counter to show how many strength points are uh, deployed. And so the number on the counter is the, the fire strength points they get for the number of skirmishers they have deployed. So if you deploy one skirmisher, your fire strength is 1 for skirmishers, 2 for 2 skirmisher strength points, and 3 for 3 skirmisher strength points. And that's a fairly simple way to do it as far as uh, getting their firepower. And there may, may be, uh, you know, national modifiers for that as well. So depending on how, how adept they were at, at that particular uh, area of expertise. So the other type of skirmisher is skirmishers on Debendad, which is the entire battalion or uh, company deployed in skirmish order. And that was commonly used during the French Revolution and was also used when occupying difficult terrain. So units that are capable of going full skirmish mode are indicated by a little bugle on their counter. And so uh, we have a marker, which is the SED marker, which shows that they're in full skirmish order. And so units in full skirmish order have all around facing. So they have uh, no particular orientation that they need to be in. They can fire in any direction. They can move in any direction. So deploying skirmishers um, helps protect the parent unit against fire combat from other units. It also helps in uh, close combat as the unit approaches to help shield the battalion. Um, it gives a little bit of a positive uh, benefit defensively, which is the minus one on the, on the counter hit to the opposing side's fire strength. And for full skirmish, it's minus two. But it also has an impact on their combat ability. <clears throat> so there is a detriment when they're charged if they've got all those skirmishers out in front, then it becomes more difficult for them to uh, see what's happening in front of them and to decide when to form square. <laughs> and likewise, for uh, full skirmish mode, they're, they're a little bit difficult to control, so they have a minus two close combat value modifier <clears throat> when they get assaulted or charged. Um, and uh, the other impact of being in full skirmish mode for the battalion and brigade game is that in order for them to be in command, they have to pay, pass a, a check against their morale <laughs> in order to be in full command. Otherwise, they're out of command, which reduces their movement allowance and they, they can't receive uh, attack or reserve orders, which we'll get to in another video. So for skirmishers, um, to change into full skirmish mode is a formation change, 
which cost two movement points for infantry. Um, deploying skirmishers with the parent battalion, the, the SK markers, it doesn't require any, uh, any formation change and doesn't cost any movement points. So players can throw those out whenever their uh, unit is allowed to move voluntarily, or they can recall them whenever they're allowed to move voluntarily. Now, another formation that is common in the Napoleonic period is a square. And square was used uh, primarily against cavalry, but it was occasionally used when an all-around defense was required against uh, uh, infantry attacks. So a square has all-around facing, so it can fire in all of its adjacent hexes. It can uh, move in it, any adjacent hexes, but if it moves too far, it will uh, have to take a disorder check. The strength of a square is rather limited. It's only uh, one strength point that can fire out of a hex, but it can fire at two non-adjacent hexes. So it could fire here and here if needed, or here and here, but not here and here together. So artillery can be in one of two formations. It can be uh, unlimbered, which is shown by the gun side up, or it can be in limbered mode, which if the artillery piece has uh, only a single step, then it has a limber uh, symbol on the back side. Otherwise, there's a marker for it. it also All right, so the last one we'll, we'll cover is road column. So units in road column, you can be in road column on, uh, on a road or trail or off a road or trail. <laughs> but only one counter can be stacked in a hex. And that's, so whenever, whenever artillery um, gets on a road or trail, it's automatically in road column. So they just move down the road as needed when they hit the road without a formation change. So units can change formation while they're moving or as a reaction if they're confronted by a cavalry or, or other threats that they might wanna change facing or formation and we'll cover that in a separate video. But uh, to change formation from, say, column to line, you just rotate the counter in the hex and expend the movement points uh, required to make the formation change. And same thing for entering square or leaving square and artillery limbering or unlimbering. When formation changes. When infantry changes formation, it costs two movement points. So to change from column to line would be two movement points. Um, cavalry uh, pays four. And artillery unlimbers with two and limbers with four.